Hey folks, I'm Demotro. Welcome back to my combo classroom, where we're a little early for grade negative two. The starting bell has not rung quite yet, but I do want to make some bonus videos about various little mathematical topics this week. And of course, some of those videos will be about numbers. And so I thought it was a good time to clarify some of the common types of number that we might encounter and what these names really mean. Which ones of these types of number are subsets of others? Which ones are exclusive from others? And what really are the definitions as well as a gut feeling for what these mean? Now, there's an infinite amount of ways we could analyze numbers or number systems we could invent, but we want our equations to have some language to interpret them in, some rules that they follow, and unless we clarify otherwise, these rules are going to be the rules or the landscape of the real number line. Sometimes we will need to step out another dimension from here to what's known as the complex numbers that include the real numbers, as well as imaginary numbers like I and combinations of those. And sometimes we may even need to step further beyond that. But unless you hear otherwise, you can typically assume that you're going to be talking about the real numbers. And these are some common important types types of real numbers that I want to make sure you really have an understanding of. First, we have the integers that are the first type of number you would encounter, whether trying to come up with numbers for how many things there are in the world, or if you were studying math in your elementary or primary school. And the integers are essentially numbers without any fractional components, such as zero, one, negative one, 10, negative 20, those are all integers. But a number like one half is not an integer because whether we write that as a fraction or a decimal, it's not a clear unit, a clear amount of multiples of the number one and so it doesn't fit our integer category, but it is still a rational number. Rational numbers include all of the integers, all of the fractions, and all of what you might call mixed numbers that are technically fractions, but something like two and a half, which also could be written five halves. The rational numbers are the numbers which can be written as a ratio, which is in the name, of two different integers. So you need to be able to have an integer on your numerator, an integer on your denominator, and then you are a rational number. And it does include the integers because we could say that the number two could be written as two oneths. <laughs> And so the integers are included in this definition of being able to be a ratio of two integers. And the rational numbers also have another distinction from what are called the irrational numbers. We count in a base 10 system, but whatever similar system we might have counted in, a base 6, base 2, base 12 system, there's going to be a trait that decimals, or whatever you would call the decimal in another base, because deci does have the word root of 10, but the things after the point in the number, we would have a different trait for the rational numbers and the irrational numbers, which are the numbers that cannot be written as a ratio of two integers. And the trait they have different from each other is that if I have a rational number, say the number two we'll use again, it will end in some sort of repeating decimal. And we're writing this in our base 10 system, but it would be true in any base. In the case of two, we can imagine an infinite amount of zeros after the decimal, which is a repeating thing. In the case of something like one-third, 
we get 0 0.3333 going on forever. And although it's an infinite non-zero decimal representation, it is periodic. It repeats this period length one thing an infinite amount of times. And if I ever try and write an irrational number in our base, or in binary, or base 12 or 6, it will not have a period in its infinite decimal representation. It will need to have an infinite amount of digits after that point, but there will never be a point where they repeat in a period. And the irrational numbers, many people think of as just one set of things that includes such as pi, the classic constant e, the square root of two, the golden ratio, and so on. And those are all irrational numbers, which on this real number line still have a place. Like pi would be a little beyond there, but we could say if that's two, the golden ratio is about there. And so the square root of two similarly would be not too far under that. And so let's clarify, that one's the golden ratio, that one's the square root of two. And so they still live on the real number line, but they don't behave as neatly as rational numbers. We can't write them either as a ratio or fraction of two integers or in any decimal that's going to have a repeating period where we can stop writing it and say write a line over it to signify the repetition. Even something like one seventh, which has a stranger cycle, it repeats a six digit string, does repeat. Whereas all of those others, square root of two, golden ratio, pi, and so on, don't. But they shouldn't necessarily just be clumped into one category of irrational numbers, because these next two names on here are essentially the two types you could have of irrational numbers. First, noting algebraic numbers, I didn't say that it was an algebraic irrational number. So algebraic numbers actually also include our integers, our rational numbers, and some of our irrational numbers that we would call our algebraic irrationals. And the irrationals that aren't algebraic are what's known as transcendental. So what does that mean? Well, you may know polynomial equations. That's where you have things like x squared minus x minus 1, or x squared minus 2, or you could make a longer one, x to the fifth plus 3x squared minus 7. Anything that you string together a variable to different powers if chosen, or technically they're all to different powers, some it might just be the first or zeroth power, and some coefficients at times, you can create a little polynomial expression. And when we look for what's called roots of a polynomial, those are the times that it equals zero. And for example, x squared minus two, if I ask for the times that this polynomial equals zero, well, one good answer to that is the square root of two, and the other answer is negative the square root of two, which we actually should write separately or write it as a plus or minus thing, because this radical symbol actually does just imply the positive answer in this case. It's a misconception that the radical symbols imply both. If I want to imply both, I can put a plus or minus to take care of that. Now, this plus or minus root two, we can put the negative one down there as well. That would be around there. Are solutions or roots to this little polynomial equation. Similarly, this right here, x squared minus x minus one, if I set that to zero, the roots of that are going to include, the more popular of the two roots, is the golden ratio, which is about 1.618, but it's gonna have one of those infinite non-repeating decimals. So a clearer way to say what it is, is the golden ratio is one plus the square root of five all over two. Now, 
these numbers, the golden ratio and the square root of two, not only were we able to write them, not just with a fraction, but using this concept of taking a root. And if I was allowing these roots, in this case, square roots, cube roots would be necessary for certain polynomials, then I might be able to express these numbers in a very neat way. But if I have the number pi, it's going to be a little trickier to come up with a good representation for that because the number pi isn't the root of any typical polynomial. And by typical, I mean that you have to be very nitpicky and careful with your definitions to not have some loophole. And by typical, I essentially mean you don't have an infinite amount of terms, you don't have an irrational number for a coefficient, and some things like that that would let you have a possible loophole. Any finite length polynomial with rational coefficients can't be created that the number pi will be a root to. That's been proven. The number pi, to come up with a representation for it, I'm not going to be able to whip up something with square roots or cube roots. I'm going to need some sort of infinite series or infinite fraction that converges to the number pi. And there are a lot of cool examples of that we'll go into in the future. Awesome infinite series that strive toward pi and can be seen to be equal to pi when we analyze them as their limit. Similarly, there's many cool ways to create the number e, which is about 2.7 and another great irrational number. But both of these, pi and e, are not the root of any of those typical polynomials, which makes them in this category known as transcendental numbers. Transcendental numbers are the real numbers that are not algebraic and they're automatically irrational because the definition of algebraic is essentially to be a root of one of these finite length rational coefficient polynomials. And there's an interesting tale we'll go into in the future of how with some polynomials, when you get up to level five, there are some that behave weirder and I can't write an answer to them as neatly. That was something that the mathematician Galois was investigating and did a lot of cool research in before he died in a duel at a very young age. I'm not kidding, a literal duel. I'll tell that story sometime. It's a cool math history. But in any case, the common ones we may encounter here are often going to be smaller than a level five degree polynomial. And it turns out that anything of levels two or called degrees technically two, three, which would involve cubes or four, can be written with their solution in a pretty neat way as well. A form that would be something along the lines of what the golden ratio has, where you have rational coefficients and integer numbers combined in a ratio, but you also let yourself use some roots. So going forward, let's remember that when we look at irrational numbers, there is going to be a pretty clear difference and differences in behaviors between the transcendental ones, such as pi and e, and, such as, and between the algebraic irrational numbers. We also will spend plenty of time and some whole episodes where I note that we're only looking at integers or even only looking at positive integers or only looking at rational numbers because some of these little realms do have neat traits of their own. And as we go into more definitions of what numbers really are in the future, fields and rings and groups and such, well, it notes some interesting traits that the integers themselves have, the rational numbers themselves, and the real numbers altogether, and then the complex numbers. So one question for you to think about in the meantime is, do any of these groups of numbers, if you were, and I don't necessarily mean group in the sense of group theory, so I meant that in a casual way, do any of these names of numbers or types of numbers have the property that if you just looked at the numbers of that type, 
they would be what you can call closed under addition or multiplication or other operations. And by closed, I mean, if I multiply two members of that type, I get another member of the same type. So for example, with the integers, as a little clue, I could say that those are closed under addition because if I add any two integers, I get another integer. How about subtraction or multiplication or division? Those are some interesting questions for you to ponder. We'll get more in depth in the future. I just wanted to clarify some of these common types of real number that we will be analyzing at some point in grade negative two. Stay tuned for some other fun little math videos throughout this week. And for the more official beginning of grade negative two, coming on the main Combo Class channel pretty soon. In the meantime, make sure you've checked out the long documentary-like finale episode I put on there, which was a crazy adventure about the process of making grade negative one and transforming to the point that we are at now. Love you all, and I'll see you in the next one.